Welcome to Our Hope, a production of Chosen People Ministries. The story of Purim begins in ancient Persia with a Jewish orphan girl named Hadassah who is known by the Persian name Esther and is crowned as the new queen. In this story, we have other characters. There is the villain, Haman, a high official in the king's court who is descended from King Agag, an old enemy of Israel. And there is Mordecai, Esther's cousin, who had once foiled an assassination plot against King Ahasuerus, saving his life. Wicked Haman plotted to have all the Jewish people in Persia killed by royal decree. When Mordecai hears about this, he sends a message to Esther to intercede for her people. The only problem is Esther cannot approach the king unsummoned. In fact, she could be killed for it. Esther calls on her people to pray and fast for three days as she prepares to approach the king. With God-given favor, Esther approaches the king and receives his permission to speak. She invites both the king and Haman to attend a banquet she is hosting. Instead of telling the king right away about Haman's wicked plot, Esther wisely waits for the right time and invites them to another banquet. It is here that Esther finally reveals the details of Haman's evil plans to have all the Jewish people in Persia murdered. Haman is hung on the very gallows that he made for Mordecai, and another royal decree is issued that says all Jewish people are allowed to defend themselves on the 13th of Adar. A holiday is then created to remember all these events, and that holiday is called Purim. In this episode, our guest Kathy Wilson shares how this holiday is celebrated, what it means to the Jewish community, and how it holds meaning for us today. Here is the host of Our Hope Podcast, who is now back from paternity leave, Abraham Vazquez. Kathy, welcome back to Our Hope. Thank you. It's good to be with you again. So let's let's talk a little bit more about Purim, this, this holiday. How many times is God's name mentioned in the book of Esther? Zero. Ah, no and, and why is that? Why is that? Isn't that interesting? Some people have been led to doubt the authenticity of Esther because God's name is not mentioned. But have we seen through reviewing some of the backstory and the events that God is clearly in control of every detail? He's intervening in the lives of the Jewish people who are the apple of his eye. He's protecting the Jewish people. And I really believe that we see who God is with the eye of faith, the faith that God has given us, his believers, uh, his followers, the believers in Jesus. And we know that God and Satan are the invisible players who impact the humans on the stage, the kings and the queens. Esther's Persian name, it means star. And the connotation of star is hidden. Stars are hidden until they shine brightly in the darkest night. And we know that uh, this certainly was a dark time for Israel, but there are those who think that God was hidden. No, no, he was on display. We read of many non-coincidences, and I mentioned some in going over the backstory, those non-coincidences in Esther put God on display. Jewish Esther became queen. Jewish Esther continued to find favor with the king. Jewish Mordecai sat in a governmental seat within the Persian empire. Mordecai was in the right place at the right time regarding hearing about that assassination plot and putting an end to that. Esther asked for a seemingly random second banquet for the purpose of God's plan, for the purpose of God intervening by allowing events to occur that needed to occur, and the king not being able to sleep so that he may discover Mordecai's uh, rescue of his life. 
God intervened time and time again throughout this book. And as I say, as I said before, God is on display. The spotlight is on God's providence, his providential care of the Jewish people. Yeah, and that's awesome. The book of Esther is one of my favorite because of the way God is just working through Esther. And he, he's, he's clearly in everything, but you don't see him, but you see him in all the, the things that are happening around. And so it, it just reminds me of how life is today. You know, we don't necessarily have like the prophets or we don't have like a pillar of fire or anything like that, but we see God in, in each other. We see God in the things that are happening around us. So um, to Purim, how is Purim celebrated today, both in Israel and the United States? It is very widely celebrated, and I'm going to say it's more wildly celebrated <laughs> in Israel. Mm -hmm. In Israel, it's Purim is the national dress-up holiday in Israel, and it extends to offices and schools. It extends to the entire nation. Mm -hmm. And every year on Purim, a free street party is hosted, and thousands of partiers show off their creative costumes, and it's the best place to be, I'm told, in uh, Israel at mm -hmm. Purim in Tel Aviv. Worldwide, it's celebrated, but the standard Purim activities, the Book of Esther is read on Purim night, and again mm -hmm. the next day, and every word has to be clearly heard. It's a serious message of deliverance, and a lot of Jewish people realize it, a lot don't. Mm. Uh, Noisemakers are world, groggers are world, the Megillah, the Scroll of Esther is read. When Haman's name is mentioned, people boo and hiss and stomp their feet trying to erase every memory of Haman. And when Mordecai's name is mentioned, there is cheering and shouting. And it's a wonderful Purim tradition uh, per the book of Esther to donate to those in need. And we find it in the ninth chapter of Esther uh, regarding sending portions of gifts to the poor, of treats to people. And that's called Mishlaoch Manot, sending of portions. And that tradition begins in childhood. Children from very young ages wrap up sweet treats to give to friends during the holiday. The Ashkenazi Jews, the Eastern European Jews will bake hamantaschen. Hamantaschen, you know what that literally means? Haman's pocket. And uh, Jewish people embrace their own people. They reach out to their own people, whether they believe with them religiously or socially. It's a carnival-like celebration. Purim spiels are enacted. Those are theatrical extravaganzas. And they even hold beauty contests and model various fashions, much like Esther went through in her experience in preparing for the king. So bottom line, the primary tradition of Purim is to celebrate. We'll be right back. Shalom. My name is Nicole Vaca, and I'm one of the co-producers of Our Hope podcast. We created Our Hope to be a window into the Messianic community, a place where we can discuss Israel and the Bible, and a resource for people who want to share their faith more effectively and compassionately with the Jewish community. If you are interested in supporting what we do, you can donate to Chosen People Ministries at chosenpeople.com slash donate. You can also support us by sharing this podcast on social media with your friends and family, or by writing a review on Apple Podcasts. We are so grateful for your support, and we hope you enjoy the rest of this episode. So do you have a memory of Purim that you would like to share with us? Yes, I do. I think my most stirring memory of Purim happened about five years ago. Uh, we had just presented such a festive Purim celebration at a retirement center with a 90% Jewish population. 
And I stopped at a Jewish care center in Phoenix, which was actually the premier Jewish care center in Phoenix, to give out Purim goodie bags full of treats. And there was a small elderly man in the common area. Truly, he was wistfully looking out the window. He seemed so lonely. And I called out to him. And as soon as I asked, are you Jewish? I knew that I shouldn't have asked that question. Uh, perhaps he had come through the Holocaust. That question, are you Jewish? Throughout the, the centuries, throughout history, has struck fear in hearts. And I apologized. And then I told him, the only reason I'm asking is because it's Purim. And I would like to wish you a happy Purim. Chag Sameach. And I'd like to give you a goodie bag. And he immediately responded with no. He was so emphatic. And I smiled and I told him happy Purim. And then I walked down the corridor. Well, I placed the goodie bag at my friend's doorstep. She wasn't home. And when I turned around, I nearly bumped into the man. He had followed me and he told me he was sorry that he was so abrupt. No, I told him I'm the one who needs to apologize to you. And I shared with him at that time that I presented a Purim program at another retirement center and that I'm not Jewish, but that I connect the dots between the Tanakh and the New Covenant and that I teach against anti-Semitism. And he began to cry and he took my hand and kissed it. And I mentioned Jesus and he rolled his eyes. I said, I realize I may have offended you when I mentioned Jesus, but I believe that Jesus is the Mashiach, the promised one of Israel. And then the man asked me, you believe in the Mashiach? Would you come in and talk with me about this? So I visited 88 year old Yuri that afternoon for two hours. And he told me, I like what I'm hearing call me and let's visit again. So two friends and I visited Yuri regularly for years. And at every get together, Yuri stood at the table, the head of the table, asking questions about God, questions that he had pondered and noted on paper prior to our gatherings. You see, Yuri had questions about God for over 70 years. And as a young man in Eastern Europe, he had been told by religious leaders in his town that answers could not be given to him because he was Jewish. Hmm. Then we asked, do you believe that Jesus died for you? And he responded with, you know, I need to think about that. I'll let you know. And he let us know during our next visit. Uh, he said, yes, I believe Jesus died for me. And at that visit, Yuri listened like never before. It was our last visit with Yuri. He died shortly after that visit. And to this day, we miss him greatly. And I do believe and I look forward with more visits with Yuri in the presence of the Mashiach, Jesus. Wow, that... <laughs> I think we could just end the podcast right there. Like, <laughs> that is such a beautiful Purim story, though he's not with us. I mean, we, it's clear where he is, and, and I'm uh, super encouraged to hear that. So I think our listeners are starting to see the connection between uh, the celebration of Purim, the Book of Esther, and some of the lessons that we can glean from those. So can we talk a little bit about those lessons? What, what can we learn from the Festival of Purim? We can understand, we can learn God's love for Israel through reading of the biblical principles in the Book of Esther. Ironically, we can learn about the character of God from the book the book that does not mention God and those unconditional promises that he made to the Jewish people, they're the glue of the Bible. Esther is laced with irony. It could be read, truly, it could be read as a satire on the futility of attempting to thwart God's plan. As believers in Jesus, we need to realize that once again, anti-Semitism has reared its ugly head in the book of Esther. And it continues to do so today, but it was defeated in Esther. And Satan is a defeated foe. Last year during an in-person Purim celebration, I shared with many Jewish people who attended that it's our desire 
as Gentile believers to come alongside the Jewish community against anti-Semitism. And I told them that we also need to share with our Gentile believer friends that Jesus spoke against those who will not come alongside the Jewish people during future persecution. And I asked them to consider Jesus as the quintessential Jew who in his sufferings has embodied the Jewish experience for all time. I asked them to consider coming to understand that through Jesus' sufferings, Jesus is indeed the Jewish Messiah. So those are some great lessons. And I think the Gentile believers uh, listening to this are, one, learning a lot. And and two, they're kind of understanding how they can engage in a conversation with their Jewish friends um, when it comes to the Festival of Purim. So how can Gentile believers get involved or show their Jewish friends that they appreciate the significance of this festival? They can encourage their Jewish friends who are not yet believers to a Purim celebration. Uh, They can go over the book of Esther with their Gentile believer friends to get in tune with it so that they can share that with their Jewish non-believing friends. They can set up goodie bags. We've had assembly lines of people setting up goodie bags at Purim so that they can be distributed to Jewish friends, to um, at that time retirement centers with large Jewish populations. We began a gift basket ministry during Purim in 2001, and we give gift baskets to Jewish people with treats and with the gospel message and with a flyer that invites them to one of our outreaches. The first year of giving gift baskets, we delivered one to a young Jewish girl, a non-believer who had been diagnosed with an inoperable brain tumor. Her mother told us that she was so delighted. Her daughter was so delighted to receive the basket of wonderful gifts. And she read the pamphlet that, that the mother emphasized that her daughter read the pamphlet. And soon afterwards, she died. She read about Jesus and perhaps we'll see her in glory. Ask your Gentile believer friend to act in a Purim spiel, and we're doing that next Mm -hmm. week. And ask your Gentile believer friend to pray with you for the Jewish people and to wish their Jewish friends Chag Sameach, Happy Purim. Thank you, Kathy, so much for joining us. We really appreciate your time and sharing with us the insights in Purim. Therefore, they call these days Purim, after the name of Pur, and because of the instructions in this letter, both what they had seen in this regard and what had happened to them, the Jews established and made a custom for themselves and for the descendants and for all those who allied themselves with them, so that they would not fail to celebrate these two days according to their regulation and according to their appointed time annually. So these days were to be remembered and celebrated throughout every generation, every family, every province, and every city. And these days of Purim were not to fail from among the Jews, or their memory fade from their descendants. Esther chapter 9, verses 26 through 28. The book of Esther inscribes yet another victory for God's people in the face of anti-Semitism. That's why Purim is such a joyful celebration. It commemorates God's faithfulness to preserve his Jewish people in the midst of persecution. Like Queen Esther, we can be bold to stand against the injustice of anti-Semitism and yet do so with grace and humility, remembering that our role is first as intercessors before the one true God. So to everyone celebrating Purim this season, Chag Purim Sameach, a happy Purim to you.